Okay, here's the list of major actors in today's show. This is as good a place as any to put Arnolfo de Cambio in such a list. As I've said, he was one of the most ubiquitous artists of his age, and among other things attributed to him, we'll see the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence in this lecture. We'll also hear about the famous Baptistry Doors competition in 1402, with which it's often said the great 15th century renaissance in Florence really began. And Lorenzo Ghiberti is going to win that competition and then go on to make a second set of doors as well, which Michelangelo said was worthy to be the gate to paradise. We'll also hear about Donatello, who is now regarded as an even more important sculptor and who did many of the most well-known things of the century. Luca della Robbia was regarded as at least his equal by their contemporaries, and was often so regarded even as late as the early 20th century. His reputation has fallen since then, but he is certainly one of the most important artists of the age. And we'll also begin to hear about painting in the 15th century when we get to Masaccio and his famous frescoes in Santa Maria della Carmine in Florence. So last time I mentioned that Petrarch worked a while in Milan for Giovanni Visconti, and the latter might have owned a helmet something like this. Milan was in fact famous for making armor long before it was famous for making the fashionable clothes of today. Armor was not meant to reflect the actual appearance of the wearer. I guess that goes without saying. In fact, the purpose was in part to conceal his actual physical appearance very often and make him seem more impressive or intimidating than he really was. This is why men were so slow to give up wearing it, I think. Any 97-pound weakling could look like Richard the Lionhearted and stuff like this. This is a complete suit of armor made in Milan about 1400. The 14th century was a hard time, especially the second half of it. There was the 100 Years' War in the north, the Black Death all over Europe. There was the Avignon Captivity and the schism that followed, which shook up the whole of Christianity. Barbara Tuckman, in her book about all this, called A Distant Mirror, says that the 14th century was the most calamitous in history. There were, however, some who thrived in this kind of atmosphere, and the Visconti of Milan were among them. Jacob Burkhardt, in his famous discussion of the Renaissance, calls Milan the city of strife. This is the statue of Bernabo Visconti in the Castles Forcesco in Milan. As a work of art, it's a pretty impressive thing for its day, the late 14th century. It was made by a fellow named Benino de Campione, who isn't well known now, but there is probably no earlier stone equestrian statue that's this big. It's life size. When Giovanni died in 1354, he left his territory to his three sons, including Bernabo here. Giovanni did not die of the Black Death. In fact, Milan, like Rimini, was not seriously affected by it. The claim in Milan being that the Visconti, like the Malatestas in Rimini, were so evil that even the plague feared to go there. Bernabo is shown here surrounded by the virtues, but they aren't very prominently displayed. He had the distinction of being in fact excommunicated by two popes at the same time. When one of the bulls of excommunication arrived, Bernabo made the luckless emissary eat the whole thing, including the lead seals. You can see the symbol of his family. The viper on his chest. And this became one of the symbols of Milan. You can see it today on Alfa Romeos, which are made there. It actually has a religious origin in the bronze serpent in the cathedral, which is said to be the very one used by Moses to cure the Jews of their snake bites during the Exodus. His wife, as I mentioned last time, was Regina della Scala, who was one of the few who could control his temper. They had 17 children. There's a very interesting series of frescoes in the so-called Spanish chapel in Santa Maria Novella in Florence, painted by the little-known Andrea de Bonaiuto, who was also an architect and a participant in the contest 
to determine who should put the dome on the cathedral. And you can see his idea on the left in the background there. We don't have time to go into all the details of this work, but it is thought to contain portraits of a lot of important people, including Bernabo here. This is the Visconti Castle in Pavia, which was built by Bernabo's brother, Galeazzo II, who got Pavia as his share of their father's estate. It probably looks a lot like the old Visconti Palace in Milan did, but the Milan Palazzo was entirely rebuilt later by the Sforzas, about whom we'll hear later. Bernabo assassinated Matteo, the third brother who had gotten Parma and who was drunk all the time anyway. And after Galeazzo died, a presumably natural death here in Pavia, Bernabo put the latter's son, Gin Galeazzo, his nephew, under house arrest to keep an eye on him. But the boy seemed introspective and bookish and uninclined to cause trouble. In any case, Bernabo did have a famous mercenary at the head of his bodyguards, the English knight Sir John Hawkwood. This is Hawkwood, painted on the north wall of the Cathedral of Florence by Paolo Cello. The Florentines had promised Hawkwood a statue as part of his payment for later services rendered to them, but after his death, they just had this painted instead. There wasn't much he could do about that, and it's still quite an honor. Life-size, right on the wall of the cathedral. Hawkwood was a famous English soldier who had been knighted in 1356 at the age of just 21 on the battlefield of Poitiers by the Black Prince himself. During the period of the Peace of Bretigny after 1360, when there was at least a little less fighting in the north, he led a band of mercenaries called the White Company into Italy, and in 1385 he was working for Bernabo when the latter's nephew, Gian Galeazzo, proved to be more ambitious than he had been thought to be and bribed Hawkwood to look the other way, while his men ambushed Bernabo and his two oldest sons. He had them poisoned and then took over in Milan himself. You can see a portrait of Gene Galeazzo in the spectacular Visconti Hours book commissioned by him. An Hours book, you'll remember, is essentially a book of prayers. In a narrower sense, it contained the prayers for the service of the divine office. In monasteries, we'll hear more about his larger contributions to the history of art shortly. He was said to have been the handsomest man in Italy. Whether or not he was really handsome, he was rich, and I think some at least are inclined to imagine that rich men look better than the rest of us. He was also well connected. He married the daughter of King John the Good of France. His sister married the son of Edward III, Lionel Duke of Clarence, probably the tallest man on the planet at seven feet. And his daughter married Louis d'Orléans, the brother of Charles VI of France, and he is himself the ancestor Gian Galeazzo here of all the kings of France from Francis I on. This is a reconstruction of the so-called Astrarium made by Giovanni Dandi for Gian Galeazzo. Used primarily for astrological purposes, it was understandably considered a technical marvel of its day. Leonardo da Vinci may well have seen it. <laughs> Jean Galeazzo had big plans, and I think it's too bad Leonardo da Vinci didn't come to Milan in his day, because Jean Galeazzo would probably have made good use of him. He wanted to dam the Po River, drain the lagoons of Venice, and build the largest Gothic church in Italy, and the latter project, at least, was eventually completed. The Cathedral of Milan is, in fact, one of the few Italian Gothic churches that might actually be mistaken for a church north of the Alps. That's in part, no doubt, because at least some of the early architects were from the north. Like most churches north of the Alps, it lacks both a Campanile and a freestanding baptistry. It's important to notice, however, that it doesn't have the facade towers typical of northern Gothic churches, and the front is in fact similar in plan to many earlier Lombard churches. It's a big pentagon, 
just concealed by all sorts of Gothic ornamentation. You may also see there Baroque-style pediminted windows added centuries later, and although it was begun in 1386, the year after Gin Galeazzo assassinated his uncle Bernabo, the church wasn't really finished until after 1800. This kind of stylistic anomaly is one of the things most art historians don't like about it. It is, in fact, one of the most well-documented building projects of its age in Italy. A lot of the early surviving paperwork, in fact, consists of complaints and recriminations thrown back and forth between the architects and the workmen. The east end of the church, which you see now, was begun first, as was often the case with such projects, so that the altar end of the church could be in use during the completion of the whole building project. And here the eye of the art historian isn't so offended by the stylistic ambiguity of the facade. It's claimed locally that these are the largest stained glass windows in any Gothic church, and they're at least close to that. In Italy, they're by far the largest, I'm sure. They're about 70 feet high. The church underwent a big restoration project in the 1980s, during which these windows were cleaned. But considering the size of the windows, it, it is still a surprisingly gloomy place inside. Gin Galeazzo also commissioned the building of the Certosa di Pavia, a Carthusian monastery of Pavia, begun in 1396, but not finished for over a century. Why would the richest man in Italy want to build an abbey for the most ascetic of the Christian monastic orders? Well, I guess just to associate himself with self-denial and spirituality, even if these weren't part of his character. And of course, giving something like this to the church has always been looked upon as an investment in the soul's future, something it's thought St. Peter will notice come Judgment Day. Here it is now at ground level. The facade was built in the 15th century by two Lombard architects named Amadeo di Lombardo and Lombardo di Lombardo. And so it's in the Lombard Renaissance style, which I always think of as the spare parts style, like something assembled from leftover pieces of other buildings. This is a view of the church from the cloister. It also uses just about every building material known to the 15th century. Stone of various kinds, marble, limestone, brick, terracotta. On the outside, as you can see, most of the arches are round, but this is the Renaissance round arch, not the Romanesque one. We'll hear more about this distinction later. Inside the nave, at least, is all Gothic, with pointed arches and ribbed vaults, Many important members of the Visconti and Sforza families were buried here again by way of associating themselves further with a Christian lifestyle which they practiced very little in life. Here you're looking across the cloister at the Certosa di Pavia. I don't know the exact dimensions, but it has to be one of the largest in existence. The Guinness Book of Records doesn't, I think, keep statistics on cloister size. As I said, the Carthusians were known for their asceticism, but these are no little cells for anchorites. This is like a Hilton of hermitages, the club med of monasteries. Each residence is a little two-story bungalow with a private garden. This is the tomb of Gin Galeazzo by Cristoforo Romano. Gin Galeazzo died in 1402, but this wasn't completed until the 16th century. By 1402, when he died, he had begun putting pressure with men and money on Florence and other Tuscan states. And at the death of Gin Galeazzo, the consumer confidence level just shot right up in Tuscany. And this is one of the things said to have contributed to the creation of an optimistic attitude in Florence anyway that led the cathedral chapter there to begin the famous baptistry door competition about which we'll hear shortly.
Milan today is, like many other cities that were important in the Renaissance, a big modern place. There are a lot of Italian towns, however, which still look, at least from a distance, much as they did 600 years ago. This is Mare Regione, north of Siena, which is one such place. And another is Montagnana. This is about 40 miles southwest of Venice. The wall here was built in the 13th century by the notorious Ezzelino da Romano. The town was a mile in circumference then, and it still is today. John White singles Montagnana out as the most notable walled city in Italy in his standard treatment of late medieval Italian art and architecture. It's a little off the beaten track for most tourists, however, and San Gimignano, just off the main road from Florence to Siena, is the Italian city which is probably most famous today for its medieval look. From a distance like this, it's easy enough to see why San Gimignano is today called the Manhattan of Tuscany. I mentioned when we were looking at the painting of 14th century Siena in the Palazzo Pubblico there by Ambrogio Lorenzetti, that most cities in Italy once had many tower houses, but no city still has as many impressive ones as San Gimignano. Here's a closer view of some of them. The highest one is the Torre Grossa at 170 feet. It's attached to the town hall. The Ragnosa Tower at the upper right is part of the old Palazzo del Podesta. There's some controversy over the purpose of these towers and how frequently they were used. I've always found it very hard to believe that the towers themselves could have been occupied for very long at a time. It also looks to me that any enemy would just bolt your door and leave you to starve in your skyscraper. You would have created your own prison, be hoist on your own petard. I think the real reason they were built and built so high was simply that they became symbols of family power and pride. In fact, about 1270, it was decreed that no new tower could be higher than the Ragnosa. So the Salvucci family built two towers, each just under the height limit. That looks again to me like it was something motivated more by family pride than some new idea of defensive fortification. If the Salvucci couldn't have the highest tower, then the total height of their towers would be the greatest. If you don't want to go all the way to Italy, incidentally, you can get a good look at San Gimignano in the recent movie called Tea with Mussolini. We'll see a little more of San Gimignano now and hear a piece of music called Istampeta Gaeta. Istampitas like this are thought to be among, at least, the very earliest surviving instrumental dance music. <laughs> Here's one of the towers up closer now. The Ragnosa closer up. tower. And a last look from outside the walls now. This is now the Bargello in Florence, the oldest secular building in the city, apart from a few truncated tower houses of the sort we've just seen at their full height in San Gimignano. The tower on the Bargello itself, like the one on the Palazzo Pubblico in Siena, and the clenched fist on the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence, is reminiscent of those. 
Florence did have some tower houses over 200 feet high at one time. The Bargello, or jail as it's now called, was apparently originally built to house the so-called Primo Popolo, the first Florentine government which would, could, one could call Republican or maybe even Democratic in some sense, in the 1250s after the death of Frederick II and the withdrawal of his agents. After the arrival of Charles of Anjou, his men were installed in it as the de facto arbiters of Florentine government. They left after the Sicilian Vespers insurrection, about which we heard earlier this quarter, and the Florentines then set up the government known as the Priorate in 1283. In its early history, members of the seven guilds, known as the Arti Majore, elected six priors and also chose a Podesta, as he was called, to be a nominal head of state. This is the courtyard of the Bargello now. The Bargello now houses the Florentine National Sculpture Museum, which displays many important Renaissance works we'll see in the coming weeks. It's a 13th century building, so it's often called Gothic, despite the fact that there's not a pointed arch to be seen. So much for consistency among art historians. The Podesta was a kind of unique figure in the history of Italian politics. Many cities had one. He was typically a foreigner, apparently on the theory that no local man would be free enough of various long-established influences to be a fair head of state. Likewise, a local man would have had to consider what might happen to him after he left office, whereas a foreigner could leave town and not have to deal with any angry constituents. The Bargello is sometimes called the Palazzo del Podesta, since it was apparently used as the residence of this fellow. About 1400, after some bad experiences, the office of Podesta was replaced by that of Gonfaloniere, standard bearer of justice as nominal head of state, though limited in actual power, and he was always to be a Florentine citizen. However, throughout the 15th century, the greatest century in the history of Florence, most political decisions were in fact made by the leaders of the wealthy influential families like the Medici, regardless of what actual office, if any, they held. In this photo you can see the Tower of the Bargello again, and also that of the Badia across the street from it on the left. Badia is a corruption of Abbazia, meaning abbey, and the first Benedictine, Benedictine abbey in Florence was established here in the 10th century, though probably none of the original building is above ground anymore. It was extensively modified by Arnolfo de Cambio around 1300, and then pretty much rebuilt in the 17th century. The 14th century Campanile is the oldest surviving part of the whole complex. You'll remember that I mentioned last week, or the week before I guess it was, that Donny was a member of the Priorate in 1300, and at that time the government was meeting in the Badia, but its original meeting place is said to have been the 13th century Torre della Castagna, about a block away. And that's what you see here. This is itself a truncated tower house that may at one time have been part of the outer fortification of the abbey. This is a modern portrait of Arnolfo de Cambio now, opposite the cathedral of which he was apparently the original architect. I mentioned that he is also said to have remodeled the Badia, and if he really worked on all the architectural and sculptural projects which are today connected to his name, including Santa Croce and the Palazzo Vecchio, he must have been the busiest man in Florence. He is traditionally given credit as sculptor for the statue of Charles of Anjou we saw earlier, and also for the bronze St. Peter here in the Vatican. Donatello is usually given credit for reintroducing life-size freestanding figures into the sculptor's repertoire, but Arnolfo was very close to that. This is close to life-size, and it's essentially freestanding, even though it's sitting down. The same thing could be said of the figure of Charles of Anjou, for that matter. 
The faithful who touched St. Peter's foot have nearly worn it away, as you can see here. Arnolfo is also said to have been responsible for this Madonna in the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo. It was part of the decoration of the old facade of the cathedral. She was done at about the time Cimabue and Giotto painted their versions of the subject around 1300. We saw those in the Uffizi Gallery, remember? <laughs> As I mentioned, Arnolfo is also said to have been the original architect of the Palazzo Vecchio, the old palace, or the Palazzo della Signoria, which is its official name, built between about 1299 and 1314 to serve as the headquarters of the government. In 1378, the number of priors was increased to eight, chosen by lot from those members of 21 guilds who met a certain varying list of qualifications, usually having to do with how much money they had. These guilds were more like businessmen's associations, really, than what we think of now as unions. Florence was a de facto oligarchy, and membership in an important guild was a virtual requirement if one was to have any political say at all. Many guild members didn't, in fact, practice the nominal trade involved. Donnie was a member of the pharmacist guild, but I doubt he ever filled a prescription. Bronze sculptors like Ghiberti were nominally members of the Silk Manufacturers Guild. The most important guilds were the ones which dealt with imported wool and clothing, the Calamala, and with that which was locally produced, the Arti de Lana. By the 15th century, the Lana was the most important guild in Florence. You can see now the Clenched Fist Tower, to which I've referred before, and which in the Renaissance was widely thought at least as representative of the Florentine personality as anything in the arts. With the Palazzo Publico in Siena and the Market Hall in Bruges, it is one of the most impressive urban secular buildings seen in a thousand years. You can also see in this picture Aminati's 16th century Neptune at the left, known in Florence as the Big White Thing, and beyond a copy of Michelangelo's David at the right is Bandinelli's Hercules, which Vasari said looked like a sack of zucchinis. The Florentines could be harsh critics of their own art, and Donatello said he had to come back to Florence from Padua because the people there were too nice to him and he couldn't get used to it. This is the courtyard of the Palazzo Vecchio, which has a copy of Verrocchio's Boy with a Fish in it. But the Palazzo Vecchio is not a place to go to see art, despite abortive attempts by some of the greatest artists of the Renaissance to decorate it. Like the Bargello and the Loggia dell'Anzi, which we'll see in a second, this is often called a Gothic building solely because of its date, but it has nothing significant in common with the Cathedral of Chartres about the only city in Italy where you can really see very many buildings that look Gothic at all is Venice. This is the Loggia de Lanzi, the Loggia of the Lancers, so-called because German mercenaries were stationed here in the 16th century. It was built by Andrea Orcagna, who should probably be called the most important Florentine artist of the late 14th century, it was also often used as a sort of box seat or reviewing stand for VIPs when events were taking place in the piazza. It now displays mostly copies of 16th century works of sculpture. Orcagna also made the famous tabernacle in Or San Michele, which we'll see later, and painted the famous Strozzi altarpiece in Santa Maria Novella. <laughs> The most impressive surviving private residence of 14th century Florence is the Palazzo Davanzati, which is now a museum set up in such a way as to give you an idea of what it was once like to live here. It's sometimes argued that historians focus too much on the lifestyle of the rich and famous, but that's what interests us after all. There's never been a TV show called Lifestyles of the Middle Class and Unknown. What about the poor? Well, they're just dull. Or worse, dull and disturbing. The Palazzo Davanzati is, in fact, like most Florentine palazzi, built around an open courtyard and now covered by a, a skylight. This is a style of Mediterranean architecture that goes all the way back to antiquity. 
In 14th century Florence, most of the poor would have been employed in one way or another in the manufacturing of woolen clothing for which the city was famous. The population of the city was around 90,000 and probably a third of the whole population was involved in this business. On the ground floor, some of the 15th century decoration here still survives. Jean Brucker, an important authority on the history of Florence, says that the diary was essentially a Florentine invention. He thinks that Florentines developed these out of the practice of keeping accurate business records, which led to the practice of keeping family records. Things like the letters of Cicero or the Younger Pliny or Augustine's Confessions sometimes have a diary-like quality, but I think Brucker is essentially right. Nothing being written in Northern Europe at the time is as easy to call a diary, certainly, as what was being written in Florence. Because of the parrots in the wall painting here, this is called the Parrot Room in the Palazzo Davanzati. One of the diaries which Brucker has edited is that of Gregorio Dotti, whom we can regard as a typical Florentine businessman involved in clothing manufacture and the import-export trade in wool and silk. Here you can see the parrots up closer. Here's an excerpt from his diary. This entry comes from 1403. Dotti says, For my new partnership, I have undertaken to put up 2,000 florins. This is how I propose to raise them. 1,370 florins and 25 soldi a Fiorino are still due to me for my old partnership with Michele de Ser Parente, as appears on page 118 of my ledger for stock and cash on hand. The rest I expect to obtain if I marry again this year, when I hope to find a woman with a dowry as large as God may be pleased to grant me. If I don't marry a rich woman, I'll have to find the money some other way. This is one of Dottie's New Year's resolutions for January 1st, 1404. It's the oldest surviving list I know of, of New Year's resolutions. He says, In memory of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, who freed and saved us by his merit, that he may, by his grace and mercy, preserve us from guilty passion, I resolve from this very day and in perpetuity to keep Friday as a day of total chastity. With Friday, I include the following night when I must abstain from the enjoyment of all carnal pleasures. God give me the grace to keep my promise, yet if I should break it through forgetfulness, I engage to give twenty solely to the poor for each time, and to say twenty paternosters and Ave Marias. I think he may have forgotten it a few times. He had twenty children by four wives. Here's another room in the Davanzati Palazzo Museum, which reminds me of the Gruethuse Museum in Bruges a little. There are no great masterpieces to see here, but the sort of antiques and collectibles it has can be very interesting in their own right. The kitchen which you see here now is actually on the top floor, which might seem odd, but remember this is Italy, where it can get very hot. And you wouldn't want the heat from a stove going up through the whole house in July and August. The thing on the right is called a pasta maker, but I don't know how it works. Well, now we've seen the oldest important secular buildings in Florence, including the oldest impressive private residence, and the Baptistry San Giovanni here is the oldest religious building in the city. The main structure of this building probably goes back to the early Middle Ages, but it underwent many changes in external and internal appearance between the 11th and 13th centuries. During this period it got its marble facing in its roof, and Arnolfo de Cambio is again sometimes associated with the work here. The baptistry is primarily famous for its doors, but the ceiling is covered with mostly late 13th century mosaic decoration, and Chimabui is sometimes said to have been involved with the design 
although the work went on here for many years, mostly under the direction of little-known artists, it may well remind you of the one we saw in Pisa, which is of approximately the same date, and with which Cimabue was also likely involved, and it obviously shows a similar Byzantine influence. The primary subject is the Last Judgment, Christ the Judge and Ruler here, rather than the Suffering Savior. In about 1330, Andrea Pisano, about whom we heard when I was talking about the Cathedral Campanile, was commissioned to make a pair of bronze doors for it, and you can see them now on the south side, but they were originally on the east side facing the cathedral. They tell the story, appropriately, of John the Baptist. This and the following pictures were taken before all the doors on the baptistry were moved inside the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo and replaced by copies. <laughs> Here you can see up close the panels in which John is baptizing his followers with the water of redemption, as it's called, and baptizing Jesus himself on the right in a cross section of the Jordan River. These panels are still in wonderful shape after 700 years, so obviously they didn't need to be replaced after just 70. Despite the fact that these must have been in perfectly good condition, however, the Kalamala, the importer's guild, which had responsibility for the maintenance of the baptistry, decided to replace them with a new set in about 1401, and to that end held a competition. Various circumstances are often cited to explain this. Everyone was happy that the plague had abated. Everyone was happy that Gian Galeazzo Visconti was on his deathbed and everyone was optimistic about the turn of the century. All this led to a rise in consumer confidence and a renewed interest in making and buying things generally. In any case, the competition was begun. As the story is usually told, anyone who wanted could in effect submit a resume, and then seven finalists were picked who were given a year during which to complete a test panel representative of their ability and interpretive insight. The subject was to be the sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham. Jacopo della Quercia, the important Sienese sculptor, was a finalist, and perhaps Donatello, although he would have just been only about 16. All the judges seem to have agreed, however, that the two finest panels in the competition were by Ghiberti and Brunelleschi, and you see the panels by them now on display in the Bargello. As I said, Donatello would have been very young, but they were both just in their early 20s. Before I give away the winner, you might try to make a guess yourself. The first thing to notice, I think, is how similar they are at first glance, they look almost like they could have been made by the same artist. How Ghiberti's was picked as the winner isn't completely clear. In his autobiography, he says simply that everyone agreed that his was the best and that was the end of it. Ghiberti, a great artist, was, however, also a notorious egomaniac and liar. Manetti, Brunelleschi's biographer, says Brunelleschi dropped out of the contest because the commission was offered to them jointly and he didn't want to work with a jerk like Ghiberti. Vasari says Brunelleschi dropped out because he thought Ghiberti's was better. In any case, Ghiberti got the job. There's no doubt that there are some things about this work that might have impressed the judges. His figure of Isaac stands out as much more beautiful and more gracefully posed, I think, compared to Brunelleschi's rather awkward and angular figure. Also, Brunelleschi's figures overlap the quatrefoil frame, which might have concerned the judges. Here you can see Ghiberti's winning panel up more closely. Despite the fact that the test panel was on an Old Testament subject, the doors were to be decorated with the story of the New Testament, along with figures of the four evangelists and the four great doctors of the church. Ghiberti would work on this project for the next 20 years and be paid a total of $2 million in gold, Although out of that, he did have to pay for his assistants, 
and for the bronze used to make the doors themselves. Here you can see the result. These doors were made to replace Andrea's on the east side facing the cathedral, but they were moved to the north side after Ghiberti finished the Gates of Paradise we'll hear about after the break. Consequently, they're usually called these doors the North Doors. The story is told in the manner of stained glass window narration from bottom to top, and above the evangelists and doctors in the lower two rows, you can see the Annunciation in the third row at the left. Here it is up closer. In fact, most of the panels which Ghiberti did for the doors are a good deal simpler in layout than his test panel. They're really not much different in appearance from those of Andrea, especially since they also have the quatrefoil frames which were apparently required so as to preserve a uniformity between the two sets of doors. This is the Nativity now, and the attitude of Mary may well remind you of the work of Giovanni Pisano, who posed her in a very similar way. At the upper left, you can see a self-portrait of Ghiberti and part of his signature above the Nativity scene. And here's St. Jerome, one of the four great doctors of the church, hard at work on his translation of the Bible into Latin. These doors were such a success that no sooner had Ghiberti finished them than another set was decided upon. The first set would be moved to the north entrance, Andrea's from the north entrance to the south one, and the new set would then become the main east doors facing the Duomo. Ghiberti would work on this project the rest of his life, and Vasari, who had seen all the great work of the Renaissance and was one of Michelangelo's best friends, would call the east doors the finest thing done in the whole age. Michelangelo himself would say that these doors were worthy to be the gates of paradise. Here are the East Doors now, and after the break, we'll hear more about them and then about Donatello. <laughs> 